So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a delight to be here at Open Source Summit once again. Uh, this is my second time at Open Source Summit uh, after that happened in Shanghai uh, last year. Now, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, uh, all of the talks this year are virtual, and I hope many of you would have you know, taken this as an opportunity to attend as many talks as possible. And I'm really glad that you could join into my talk. Uh, I'll be talking about IoT developers guide to building I secure IoT devices. So, uh, but before we begin, a quick introduction about me. Uh, I'm Yogesh and I'm from Nepal. Uh, I work for a company called Tata Consultancy Service India, uh, where my primary research and work focus on IoT security, hardware hacking and mobile application security. Uh, apart from that, I'm passionate about car hacking and robotics as well. Uh, when I'm not working on security, I'm probably building robots for fun. Uh, I'm also an active speaker in the community. I've spoken in front at several conferences like uh, Cyber Week, Greyhack, and Kazakhstan, mainly in security. Uh, I sometimes write on Medium as well. So you can find me on Medium as medium.com slash at Yogis Oza. So that's pretty much about me. Uh, let's look into today's agenda. Uh, we'll begin with introduction to IoT, uh, abuse cases, uh, failure stories, which will be followed by current security challenges in IoT. Uh, after that, we'll talk about threat modeling, uh, why threat modeling is very important for developers and how to build one of them. The other topic uh, where I'll spend a lot of time uh, talking about is the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. Uh, if you're not aware of what OWASP is, it's, it's a non-profit organization that releases the top 10 vulnerabilities that has been observed in the last couple of years. Uh, they do release this document for developers and security guys, and you can have a look at them. Probably you can use it to train your developers uh, about the security issues as well. Uh, we'll also talk about the best practices in terms of security towards the end of this talk. Uh, we, we have a lot to cover today, uh, a lot of material to cover today. So let's quickly dive into the talk and see what's going on with IoT security. So uh, the goal of this talk, uh, the talk is intended for developers uh, to help them understand the security issues within the IoT. And this talk is probably, you know, after this talk, probably uh, it will help you implement the security in your uh, IoT SDLC as well. Uh, but before we move, uh, you know, begin the, into the uh, dive deep into the world of IoT security, I think it's better we talk a little about Internet of Things. Uh, so the Internet of Things is basically the network of physical objects, device, building, vehicles, and other embedded electronics and sensors that enable these objects to interact with each other, exchange data, and make smart decisions based on the data that has been gathered from the environment. Also, an IoT could be any device connected to Internet, irrespective of uh, computation power, price, and the size of device. So what you see on the screen is the schematic of Internet of Things. On a high level, if you look at the schematic of Internet of Things, it consists of a hardware, a software, and a cloud. Uh, the hardware may consist of sensors, your processing unit, embedded, embedded CPU, or a microcontroller, and a storage. Uh, we now have software. Now this software might contain the firmware, mobile application, and the web application. Uh, depending on what your IoT device does with it, uh, this may have network communication as well, which most of the times it's a bi-directional communication. Uh, and a device may interact with other other little components using protocols like Bluetooth Low Energy or Zigbee as well. So now, now let's look into the IoT architecture component. And if you look at the IoT at a broad range, the hardware that we spoke about, the software that um, these uh, devices carry, and, and the application can be aggregated into a layered architecture. This is very important to know because when we talk about the security issues, understanding the architecture will help you correlate the common pitfalls of IoT within the other layers. And, and, and they could be solved within the layers as well. So you could find many architectures for IoT. This varies from company to company, people to people, and mainly uh, based on the requirements. Many of the architectures are based on one common architecture, and that is divided into physical device, is, and the platform. Physical device could be anything that could be identified as things in the Internet of Things. This physical device also have some computing power, that, and, and the chances are that it is directly attached to actuators or controllers. Depending on customers' demands and capabilities, the processing power and connectivity may vary. Then we have A's, which consist of sensors and actuators. And at last, we have platform, which is the centralized component that manages the flow of data. This also in a broad term can be classified into application layer, data processing layer, network layer, and sensing layer. On a normal IoT device, let's take an example of a fitness tracker. Uh, the mobile app, so the mobile application in your Android or iOS that you use is in the application layer. The data processing layer consists of a CPU, 
uh, that calculates your daily activities, your fitness performance, and, and does the analysis on top of that, right? So on a network layer, you could have several protocols like uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth Classic, or MQTT running on top of that. So the remaining components like the pedometer, the sensor, the GPS are in the sensing layer. So this probably would have given you a brief idea about, uh, you know, uh, about the architecture. Next, we'll look into the average cases and common pitfalls for IoT device. So now, if you if you look at this, now you've got this smart, uh, if, you, if you talk about the things in the Internet of Things, you have got everything out there. You, you, you have your smart coffee makers, you have got a door locks, even smart guns, fitness trackers, and many more. You also have the healthy devices as well. Uh, one common thing between all of these devices are that they all have connectivity. They all have a tiny little CPU and sensors that work together to perform some action. The other really common thing between all of these devices are that they're poorly designed with no security in mind. They all have history of being hacked. They, there are many reasons why these devices are poorly designed with no security in mind, which of course we're going to discuss about it later today. Uh, now let's talk about the IoT failure stories. Uh, if, you, if you remember the things in the Internet of Things, we have had the wearable implants, the, the healthcare devices, right? They're also known as pacemakers. They're used for people that have slow heart rhythm. This was found to have weakness in the transmitter, allowing potentially to change the pace, battery depletion, and even suck. In other words, it was dead. The other, the other fairly IoT failure history that cannot go unnoticed is that uh, uh, in the Mirai botnet, and back then in 2016, this was probably the biggest distributed denial of service that ever happened. And just to make things even more interesting for you, um, th uh, th there was one case back then in 2018. Uh, this, among, uh, this is one among many cases where the vulnerable IoT devices were used to compromise or you know, target the companies for the very first time. This is a very interesting case back in 2018 where the attackers used a thermostat that was connected into a fish tank. Um, th that was placed in the lobby of a casino. Uh, to gain access to the casino's high roller database and, and these kind of attacks keep happening one of the major problems with iot is that they are very basic and cheap various reasons like the time to market the cost and many other reasons these devices like the thermostats the refrigeration the smart bulbs and several other smart home components they often do not include the added security and as we keep on to adapt more and more iot devices we, we are just increasing the attack surface and while it is true that many people are working on to secure these devices, but still we are a long way off from having the secure IoT devices. As we move on to integrate more and more devices, move more, uh, we, as we move into more and more connected future, we need to understand the root cause. Are we trading off the security for the sake of convenience or not? The very common pattern when I work with customers, we tend to identify the root cause. And, and, and this root cause belongs to developers and the vendors. The consumer and industry is always looking for secure IoT devices without trading of their convenience. While on the other hand, developers and vendors are worried about their complexity. Many times, developers are not aware of security issues. The vendors are not aware what to do next when something wrong happens, or even what can be done to achieve security without complexity. These are constantly, they are constantly looking for suppliers that can provide them devices and hardware at a level of assurance that they can bring in security without complexity. A root of trust has to be established between all the parties and entities. Also, security must be considered early in the design phase, early in the marketing and engineering development cycles of devices, as well as services. This is because when I'm talking about IoT, I'm not just talking about the tiny little hardware box. Rather, I'm talking about the entire ecosystem, the entire mobile application, the, the, the mobile application communicates to, the, the web interface, the administrative, administrative console, and a lot of components inside your ecosystem. The web application dashboard, the tiny little sensor attached to it, and a whole lot in the ecosystem, right? So it's, it's very cheap for developers and for companies and vendors to uh, identify and mitigate the issues early at the design phase rather than after the production. So the current situation, uh, if, if you look at the current situation of IoT, it's, it's a little worrisome. The security is actually missing from IoT, which I really believe should never have happened, should never be the case. I do not see any fundamental or groundbreaking reasons why security should never be a part of IoT. Somewhere down the line, I feel that security in IoT has been discarded by developers for the sake of convenience, and on the vendor, this has been discarded for the sake of early time to market. Currently, the competition on market is, is, is for early time to market, 
it's for um, it's for audit time to market competition and safe in size uh, and dimensions right but not really on security there are currently millions of connected devices and billions of sensors surprisingly the numbers are growing rapidly and all of them needs to be secured hence it is important that a well designed security iot architecture are a must requirement and if you have been looking at the attack vectors where the threat actors have been attacking it's everywhere they have been attacking on device gateways the firmware or the operating system the software even even on the software system and many more so a vendor can't just secure a, a hardware device and call themselves a secure we need to check on the gateways the sensors the firewall they, they have implemented the mobile application the operating system the software system and many more so a vendor uh, so uh, and, and and if you look at the current situation as i said it's a little worrisome but there is a lot to act and there are a lot of challenges as well i think we have had enough of uh, problems in iot let's focus on the current security challenges and and, and uh, look at the ways to solve them by now you must be already asking hey there are billions of devices but what is the problem where all this began right when i work with vendors and companies one of the major problem that i have seen with companies and vendors is that people and companies think that iot security is all about device security still many people think security in iot means securing the physical device which is not true when we are talking about security in iot it is all about securing the entire ecosystem your ecosystem includes you as i said it includes your mobile application your cloud communication your device to device communication your web application and various other component if any of these component are insecure this may lead to the compromise of the entire ecosystem and not just a physical iot device so next time you hear somebody saying iot security is all about physical security you need to correct them then and there and developers need to focus on secure, secure, securing the entire ecosystem rather than the device alone the other problem is that the dependency issues you so what what happens is that your one vendor may rely on the several other vendors it is pretty tough for one single vendor to build the entire ecosystem so they might rely on the several other vendors it might so happen that your mobile application might be procured from one vendor and the hardware components might be procured from another somewhere in china right and the vendor somewhere in china the next question that arises is that how secure are those vendors do you have any controls over them do you have any idea where your customers data is being sent if the answer to this question is yes then you might be doing a great job in securing your iot ecosystem but what if one of these component in, is not in your control this is where things get serious and and this actually i think it creates a major problem the other problem that i have seen in the industry is that the never ending growth so the number of devices the number of component keeps growing at an exponential rate iot iot technologies are not mature yet and there are many challenges to overcome there there is no way we can control the growth of these devices and i don't think we should be as the number of devices continue to grow there is a lot of attack surface as we keep on to integrate more and more sensors as we continue to integrate more and more interfaces we are increasing the attack surface and also as i spoke about the dependency issues what if the vulnerability lies in the third party vendor's hardware and the vendor has no way to provide the patch how are you going to handle this and and these are the kind of question that a developer must always be prepared before building and secure uh, uh, building an architecture for your secure iot system the other problem that i have seen in the industry is that there is too much of trust between all the components so what what happens is that the solution to this is implementing the zero trust philosophy so implementing the zero trust philosophy in iot network could be an essential step in securing the entire ecosystem so why this is important so what happens is that in a traditional architecture uh, the traditional architecture believes that even if you compromise any components in the network rest of the component will treat you as a granted since you have already since you are already inside the network you remain to be authenticated right so rather a zero trust philosophy implements much strong authentication and requires strict verification even if one of the component in the, or, or the device in the ecosystem gets compromised what this does is that this prevents the lateral movement inside the network even if the even if your iot device gets compromised so like the one earlier in the 2018 case of casino had it been a zero trust inside the network the attacker wouldn't be able to gain lateral movement inside the network right so we, we we have spoken a lot about challenges we have spoken a lot about the problems let's let's try to focus on the triad and and the ways to solve them so uh, those are the pretty much challenges in iot security and of course there are plenty of them we're not going to discuss all of them but you can consider them as a primary challenges 
Now to understand threats much better and their countermeasures, we'll first look into the threats, correlate them with the CIA triad and focus on each of the countermeasures. So on a typical IoT device, common security threats are unauthorized access, physical, uh, physical destruction, information leakage, illegal data modification, denial of service attack, malware based attack, and, and this can pretty much be correlated to CIA triad. So if you're wondering what CIA triad is, it's a fundamental to information security. So, so what happens is anytime your data is leaked, okay, anytime a system is attacked or any, any number of other security incidents occur, you can be certain that one or more of these principles have been violated. So we evaluate threats and vulnerabilities based on the potential impact they have on the confidentiality, integrity, and the availability. And based on the potential, uh, based on the evaluation, we propose a set of security controls to reduce the risk. So let's let's quickly focus on each of these security requirements and let's have a look at them. So we'll begin with confidentiality. So confidentiality is a property, roughly, it's related to privacy. Any attack on data at first, data in process, and data in transit could, uh, could occur in loss of confidentiality. Some, some common attack that could hamper the C in the confidentiality is that the man in the middle attack and the replay attacks. And the security requirement for, preser for preserving the uh, confidentiality in the IoT device is that the transmitted message should be encrypted to prevent the man in the middle sniffing or eavesdropping. Similarly, the other countermeasure could be taken to preserve the confidentiality is that the device should be tamper resistant. The requirement tamper resistant is put up because the sensitive data that developers store inside the hardware chips. Also detection and defense against the malware based attack are also important for preserving the confidentiality. Now we have, now, now the other thing that we have got is integrity. Integrity is a property that maintains the consistency, accuracy and trustworthiness of data over the life cycle. One, one simple requirement to put up is that the data in transit must not be modified. This in terms of IoT can be simply put up as applying data integrity verification to avoid the data forgeries, right? So similarly for firmware abuse, developer must cryptographically check the firmware integrity before updating the firmware or applying the paths. This ensures that the developer has actually built and developed the firmware and no modification has been done on the firmware otherwise. Similarly, other attack on operating systems like modification of system configuration, to gain privilege escalation and also can be classified into data integrity. There are simple yet effective solution to preserve the integrity like check sums, you know, uh, checking the former uh, update or, or, you know, uh, or any data in transit or, you know, uh, even, even cryptographic checksums can also be implemented. There are of course challenges in implementing the encryption or crypto on a constraint uh, hardware. For example, 8-bit microcontrollers with limited RAM it could be really tough, right? So the encryption should be implemented directly into the hardware, while integrity or hashes has to be attached to the data payload or in the application layer. This reduces the load on the constant hardware exponentially. And now we have got the, uh, the property called availability, and, and, and this ensures the high availability within the ecosystem. This ensures that, your product, that you, are, you, you have done a pretty much good job in protection against the denial of service, hardware failure, power outages, and, and the updates as well. Last but not the least, we have authentication authorization. This involves giving any access to only legitimate users and providing them access based on the role. This also involves password management, authentication and access control issues. Not only the application layer authentication, but the device level authentication or device level security is also equally important. Hardware security chips like TPM allows devices to securely authenticate themselves using you know, public key infrastructure, the PKI, also known as PKI. So this is this not just ensures the authentication is done, but also ensures that the aftermath uh, aftermath as well. So uh, let's look into the OWASP top ten. I hope uh, you have had a clear picture of what requirement have to be put up. Now let's look into the top ten pitfalls that developers make mistake while uh, that developers make mistake, and it, it's it's a must must watch. I think I explained already in my slide what OWASP is. Once again, if you're not aware of what OWASP is, OWASP is a non-profit organization that releases the top 10 common security pitfall to watch for. They do this periodically uh, and, and update the list. And of course, OWASP does a lot of uh, you know good stuff on DevOps, DevSecOps stuff as well. But releasing the top 10 common pitfall is one of the major things they do. So the OWASP top 10 list is published once in every two years. So uh, hopefully sometime in 2020, uh, end of 2020, we should be able to see the new update and take a look at how things have changed since, 20, since 2014 when, when this was first released, right? So we'll talk about the top 10 security pitfalls. What are the kind of um, pitfalls that keep appearing? And this will help us to identify the vulnerabilities inside our IoT application at an early stage. 
So the first in the list we have is a weak guessable a hard coded password. It is no surprise that weak guessable a hard coded password is on the top list. As a security analyst, we have been uncovering this weak and guessable password since the day one. And it is quite easy to figure out where this is even on the list. This is because how manufacturers and developers use different password within the web interface root access or your secure cell access or the telnet passwords, right? The different passwords have been put up there. This is also on the top because the attacker won't even bother about testing other component that could lead them to uh, bypass the authentication. It is evident that one, once the attacker has the authentication bypass, pretty much every other security measure that you have implemented is obsolete. So they won't bother about how fancy or secure your crypto algorithms are. Pretty much everything else is obsolete. And not just this, we have seen IoT product that comes with a default password and do not allow the interface for users to change the default passwords. So the key takeaway for developers is that do not assume that the users will ever change the password until and unless they are enforced to do so. So all you have to do is provide and implement an interface through which user must and should change the default password. Probably you know, SIP with the default password and on the first boot ask the users to change the password compulsorily. This also, this, this also includes any API keys that has been exposed inside your ecosystem, any API key that has been hard coded inside your mobile application, right? Or any other unauthenticated API within your web interface. The second on the list we have is insecure network services. So the, the second on the list we have is insecure network services. This includes any leftover ports, any services that you have with debugging ports or the secure cell access or the telnet services or any other open port that are left over which are unused. Remember always one thing as a developer you should note, the, note down is that the, the very moment when you open open up these ports and network services you are opening up the entire attack surface. You are increasing the attack surface. And, and, and sometimes due to the quick and easy implementation of insecure services developers prefer using FTP instead of secure FTP or telnet over uh, secure cell access. And if you talk about numbers 75.04 percentage of attacks at, on IoT originate from telnet protocols. This is how serious is it not to use the insecure services. The third on the list we have is insecure ecosystem interface. This list includes all the vulnerabilities that lies inside a mobile application, uh, in a web interface, in your APIs, in a cloud console, and the weakness on any other ecosystem component. The list of vulnerabilities are long, but most commonly found are the cross-site scripting, remote code execution, or the operating system command execution uh, are known as OS command execution, also known as CSRF or on, on web interface. On the API, things like unauthenticated API, SQL injection, you know, overprivileged APIs are relevant. While on the mo mobile application side, this includes hard coding of sensitive information inside binaries. So insecure components and insecure APIs are also prevalent in, inside the APIs as well. So now, the fourth that we have on the list is the lack of update mechanism. On many of the IoT device, simply the firmware integrity sake, lack of insecure firmware delivery, delivery of firmware updated uh, firmware that has been sent on HTTP cause this kind of issue. Also many times, these developers device, these IoT devices have inefficient anti-rollback mechanism. This is important because when there are critical vulnerabilities in the version X, suppose that, that there has been, uh, you know, uh, recently discovered a critical vulnerability in the version X, you might roll out the version Y, but due to the inefficient anti-rollback, the developers will anyways downgrade to the version from Y to X. It's, it's pretty common, right? It's obvious. So always remember that the inability to update the device itself is a security weakness. Failure to install the update means that the device remains vulnerable for the indefinite time. So the fifth on the list is the use of insecure or outdated component. This holds very much true for industrial IoT where the huge number of legacy systems are still being used. This is because legacy systems are often expensive and technically difficult to upgrade. One, one vulnerable component uh, can cause and can negate all the security mechanism that you have implemented. So it's very important to keep track of vulnerabilities occurred on the component or the libraries that has been used. So the next, the next one we have is inefficient privacy protection. So this list equals all other vulnerabilities and all personal data must be stored and transmitted in a secure manner, which IoT device have commonly failed. But this, this particular case considers privacy in a deeper sense. To solve this problem, you need to know exactly what data is being collected by the IoT device. What other IoT device have, uh, sorry, uh, uh, you, you need to identify what data are being exactly collected. 
by the mobile application by the cloud interface and you need to make sure that the data necessary for functioning of device is only collected those data needs to be checked and whether there is a permission to store personal data and then do you comply with any other compliance like gdpr or not should be checked and, and should be protected whether it goes against those kind of compliance issues or not so what can you do about it what can developers do about this simple solution store as much sorry store as little information as you can as little personal data as you can even if you have to implement a data protection policy and for uh, and for unfortunate situations decide ahead the incident response plan so this might help you in case of any uh, uh, you know attacks or in case of any uh, uh, data exposure the last few on the list are insecure data transfer and insecure uh, and, and the lack of device management this both combinedly deal with the device issues this talks about lack of encryption and access control in regard to handling sensitive data and implies to both data at rest and data in transit while the lack of device uh, uh, lack of device management talks about managing the iot device in production if in case they have to be decommissioned if in case they have to be uh, you know uh, out of the production how do you do it many of the iot device currently lack this feature uh, sorry feature and, and and this is very common in industrial uh, iot as well the other we have in the list is insecure default setting this holds true because default settings default password configuration at iot devices default configuration on iot devices are often insecure and this is slowly changing some lawmakers have been fighting for this for example the california has a law that requires iot device manufacturers to set the pre-programmed password or, or require users to change the password before even uh, using the device if this kind of little security measures tiny security measures are implemented then i think we have we have reduced the attack surface by a little the last on the list we have is a lack of physical hardening this talks about tamper detection hardening the physical debug port and easily accessible iot device in public places are what to be looked out for for developers your assumption must always be that your users will always open up the device inspect and modify it not all users but some users will definitely do that and with enough motivation they'll most likely break your device so you must focus on uh, you must focus on uh, you know physical hardening as well not not only on the uh, software component but on the physical hardening as well so uh, i think we we have covered up all the top 10 wasp vulnerabilities now uh, since we have identified and learned all the common vulnerabilities let's architect the security model for an iot device the one that you see on the screen is, is based on the arms threat modeling for iot device and we have a huge topic today to cover up uh, about threat modeling that comes later uh, there are a couple of things to do before actually making the threat modeling so let's let's quickly have a look at them so when you are when, when you're uh, you know defining the security uh, secure architect for your I, iot device the first step that you always want to do is asset discovery the first things is to identify the asset and keep a track of it if you're on a mission to identify the threats and in early stages the first thing that you always want to do is identifying the asset the very next question that you might want to ask yourself is that what are the most valuable asset for you is it the former hardware uh, is it the former or the hardware component Im most important for you or uh, is it the software component is it the sensor attached to it or, or what is it so this asset discovery phase answers those kind of question identifying the asset will help you gather or say find out the potential entry points uh, for an attacker so so the next question is what consists of an asset it could range anything from firmware to a sensor attached it could be anything within the ecosystem from a web application to a mobile application as well the next thing is that generating the attack surface once you have identified the asset you would want to generate the attack surface the attack surface is all about mapping out what parts of an asset or the system needs to be tested, tested for security vulnerabilities the point of attack surface is to understand the risk associated with the iot application the other point of attack surface is to help developers and security guys be aware of the parts of the application that are likely to be attacked and of course find out ways to mitigate them as well and finding the and finding the change in attack surface is also very much important when you add new new asset when you add new um, you know when you add the new asset finding out what happens to the existing attack surface is very much important what happens when you add the new component what happens when you add the new asset does this increase or decrease the attack surface suppose it might so happen that if you introduce a you know a, a secure cell access you are increasing the attack surface but similarly if you're implementing a firewall you might be decreasing the attack surface right so these kind of questions that you that you must be ready for
once once you have identified the attack surface the next the next thing is that you are looking at the pipeline is threat modeling threat modeling helps you identify the potential risk which of your components are exposed to certain threats at this stage it is assumed that you have a clear picture of threats and exposed uh, you, and all the exposed threat you, you have a clear picture of that uh, you you also have a clear picture of all the entry points to which the threats are applicable Performing a threat modeling is very important because this helps you understand the security requirement and identify the threats before the breach occurs. And of course, there are a lot of threat modeling and I feel this is a missing, missing puzzle in most of the organizations. The other one that we have is enumerating the threats. Once the threat modeling is done, one needs to identify the severity of the threats. What needs to be mitigated first? What aligns with our security requirements and what does not? This also helps you achieve the security objective and, and address the threats that needs the immediate attention. We use something called a common vulnerability scoring system, also known as CVSS. It's a scoring mechanism between zero, uh, between zero to 10 that tells how severe the vulnerability is. Suppose if a threat or a vulnerability gets a score of nine to 10, we classify them as a critical. And of course, this needs the immediate attention. Now, once you have identified all these, the last one in the step, the last one in the pipeline is generating a threat summary table. Once once a threat has been identified and enumerated, the next step or the next action point for the for you for the developers is that to generate a threat summary table. This threat summary table will needs to have what threats you have, what mitigation mechanisms could be, and how do you uh, uh, how do you enumerate those threats and how do you remove those threats, right? So those kind of threat summary table has to be done. So this threat summary table will help you bridge the gap between what vulnerability you have. And what are the what are the mitigation mechanism? So th a threat mod once the threat modeling is done, making a threat summary table is also equally important. So now let, let's let's go back to the basics and visualize each of them. So early, earlier we spoke about identifying the asset, right? So let's visualize what kind of asset that you need to identify. So your component will include any hardware peripherals, the sensors, the communication. Uh, the mobile application, this also includes any sort of networking device or firewall as well, right? So I actually believe the asset discovery must be a continuous process. Scanning the asset passively, uh, meaning uh, avoiding any unwanted traffic will help you keep track of each asset. So anytime, anytime you release a new product or you release any update for your uh, IoT device or IoT component, you are not missing out any of the asset. You are not missing out any, any API calls. You are not missing out any components on the cloud or any communication protocol. So it is very important that you do this on a periodic, periodic basis and, and on a continuous basis. The second step is to build, you know, the second step in, in, in building secure architecture for IoT is identifying the attack surface. Uh, OWASP also releases the non-exhaustive list of attack surfaces and the attack surface that you see is a part of it. I do not want to spend a lot of time talking about this. Probably you can take a picture of this and, and of course you can find an OWASP website as well um, because anyways, we are going to visualize this in the next coming slides. So let's focus on the slides. Yeah. So visualization of attack surface. Um, so if, if uh, let's put, put all those attack surface that we recently saw into several stack layer and visualize each of them so that we could we could figure out the mitigation mechanisms based on the layers. The most bottom layer is the hardware and secure boot services. The common attack surface includes the open debug ports, the plain text communication bus, the insecure storage, tamper detection, and, and side channel attacks. If you see, the bottom layer is the most fundamental level and must be protected at all costs because it is the fundamental basis for, all, for the trust on all the higher layers. This layer provides the secure boot services and the critical components. As you, as you go uh, to the top, uh, uh, as you go to the top of the layer, the attack surface increases dramatically because there are so many ways that a malicious attacker can attempt to compromise the system. The key to build secure architecture is that, is to have a really strong layer one and layer two. This is because the attack surface is very small in this layer one and two, and it's very easy to mitigate them. And since the entire trust of the system lies in the layer one and two, I think it's, it's, it's important that you identify and mitigate the, uh, you know, the, uh, and mitigate the attack surfaces in the layer one and two very importantly. As I said, as you, as you move on to the top, the attack surface increases. In this layer, the former and core services, the attack surface includes the former, the update mechanism, the local data storage and the path management. 
The most common vulnerabilities include missing encryption, hardcoding of sensitive information, the hidden backdoors. Many times developers leave all the hardcoded certificates inside the firmware itself. And there are several ways with uh, ways with, with, with which an attacker can gain the firmware. So if an attacker gains the unencrypted firmware, you, you have pretty much everything. The other most common vulnerability is that I have seen is that developers hardcode certain sensitive URLs. Apart from that, we also have seen encryption keys being stored inside the firmware itself. The other is that the communication layer where the attacks like man the middle, the replay attacks and jamming based attacks are relevant. This is this is the communication layer. Now on the application layer, this is by far the largest attack surface that you might ever encounter. Your mobile application, this this includes your mobile application, your web interface, your administrative console, your vendor backend APIs, third party APIs, you know, your, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, your cloud interface, they all combinedly serve the largest attack surface. And the attack on this layer consists of the SQL injection, the cross site scripting, C surf, weak password, another web application layer, and many more as well. Similarly, on the API, you, you, you would find issues like, you know, unencrypted personally identified information being leaked being sent over the HTTP, which causes the privacy issues. And this also sends the user location sometimes. So you need to check out on those issues as well. Now, the, on the last we have is the authentication authorization part. Now on the authentication and authorization part, this carries a significant risk and also provides a larger attack surface. The most common issues, the most common issue that I've noticed among the developers is that they develop unauthenticated API for debugging purpose and leave them unattended uh, and leave them uh, you know off in the production as well this most of the times allows the higher privilege access the reason why i've kept this on the top is because when authentication failed pretty much every other security issues are also failed right so check out on these kind of issues as well the, the issues like missing authentication the uh, privilege escalation so make a checklist of uh, all the uh, checklist before sending out on the production that whether you have mitigated all of these attack surfaces or not Uh, so I think somebody has asked the question, what's the recommendation uh, when you have the trade-off between security and product cost? I think the next couple of slides is going to answer those questions. Uh, so to do that, let's quickly uh, you know, uh, classify the type of attack that we have encountered and divide them into their respective categories. And, and we'll then use it to compare against the cost to attack versus cost to secure. So uh, this is pretty much self-describing. You have, you have got the four main types of attack, the attacks in hardware, the attacks in communication, the software components, the attack and software components, and the cryptographic attacks. We also have got another type of attack, which is not there on the list. That is a side channel attack. If you're not aware of what side channel attack is, these this attacks are based on a side channel information that can be retrieved from a device. This allows an attacker to measure power consumption, voltage fluctuation, or other side channel information such as temperature and sound. You know, side channel attacks make use of some or all of this information to recover the key the device is using. It is based on the fact that logic operation have physical characteristics that depend on the user input data. So the example of side channel attacks include the timing attack, power analysis attack, um, you know, fault analysis, electromagnetic attacks, and, and environmental attacks as well. But on a broader meaning, they can be classified into one or more of these. So the next slide that we have is cost to attack versus cost to secure. So I think this is the same question uh, that this is this this slide answer your question. Uh, let's talk about cost to attack versus cost to secure. Right. So security is always about finding out the economic balance, um, economic cost in balance. Right. So it does not make any sense in applying $50 security for the $5 fitness tracker. But it makes sense for a $500 smart home equipment. And also security is, of course, also dependent on the valuable, uh, dependent on the value of the asset as well. So a good security architecture also includes the analysis between the cost to attack versus cost to secure. Suppose things like communication attacks, man the middle and sniffing. They are cheap to attack and cheap to secure. But will this bring in value to an attacker? Yes, but the value is very less. Rather, the attacker would be interested in more expensive attack that brings him more values. And it makes sense for him or her to spend more on securing those attacks. Uh, and, for the, uh, and it makes sense for developers to spend more on securing those attacks rather than on cheaper and easier attacks. As you move on to the software attacks and non-invasive, they are, they are costly to attacks and costly to secure. But but, but this brings more value to the attackers. The software attacks like malware attacks and social engineering attacks, this, cut, this costs them a huge effort, but the damage caused by them is also large. Similarly, the physical attacks on IoT device are boss probing, attacks on ZTAG, 
they are also difficult to pull off at the same time difficult to secure so it makes a lot of sense for you to actually divide your security budget based on these factors and finding a good balance between all of the components now let's finally get into threat modeling so threat modeling is a cost effective way of implementing the, the security in the design phase of sdlc and of course it's a great way to build websec of culture as well so it is a structured approach that enables you to identify quantify and and you know address the security risk associated with an application there are a lot of reasons why threat modeling is important a few of them could be is that it is cheaper to identify and fix the vulnerabilities during the design phase rather than to fix at the production many of the times after production you have a very little or no options left and it's also a great way to proactively identify potential issues and address them at right at the design process and notify the potential issues for developers threat modeling actually answers questions like what really can go wrong what should you do when things go wrong this got, these are the kind of questions that threat modeling uh, you know answers this also helps bridge gap between the security and development cycle and is often regarded as a critical step in understanding the security requirement of a system the threat modeling start by analyzing the operating environment understanding and documenting the ways each device could be attacked this tends to answer questions like what are my most valuable asset what are the potential threats to my device what kind of attack is most important for me to prevent at this period of time and most importantly how severe are the threats once the device has been developed and, and ready for production you could verify if a device has met all sort of security requir requirements or not have you addressed all of the threats or not any visible attack surface that is likely to be attacked has been has this been prevented or not so threat modeling if applied on the sdlc can improve your security process drastically the other one the other benefit of threat modeling is that you understand the security requirements suppose if you have identified a threat like like man the middle uh, possibly that could occur in the apis right so that could that could give you a security requirement to implement the https on production so without threat modeling it is quite impossible to work on mitigating the threat you'll only uh, you'll only identify the threats after a breach but threat modeling helps you identify before even a breach so there could be many standards for building out the uh, you know threat models but one of the very common and widely accepted is microsoft stride model there are many other models like the vast the dread and the octave but we have been using stride uh, for a very long period of time and it works really well with our customers in short you will divide the threats depending on uh, depending on what the harm it can cause to this could either be classified all the harms that it could cause could be classified into either spoofing either tampering repudiation information disclosure denial of service or elevation of privilege these are the mnemonics for the classification of threats or the classes of threats so how do you build a threat model for yourself this is a multi step process that includes searching for threats building defenses and eliminating the threats and evaluating the model the first step is to search for threats this is done by identifying the potential target to be protected and then defining its boundaries defining its boundaries and external system that it interacts with the next step is to identify the data flows within the target so if you remember earlier i spoke about the cia trial right so this is when it comes into picture identify the security requirements based on the potential impact that it can cause on confidentiality integrity and availability the next step is to search for threats this is mainly based on the enumeration this step also includes de determining the uh, known vulnerabilities here you also need to create an attack scenarios and probably play like an attacker the next step could be conducting a risk assessment and also access the likelihood of the attack so if you if you have found out an uh, you know definite risk associated with your iot application you need to access the likelihood how likely or how 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 do you think it is likely that the particular particular attack could be exploited particular threats could be exploited right so once you have identified and accessed all your threat you need to build defenses against it this includes mitigating and eliminating the threats that we recently had discovered the last is that the evalu the evaluation of model it is important to determine what is your highest priority or, or to look back at if you had missed out any vulnerabilities the evaluation model of, is important the evaluation of model is important because in a larger team not one single person will be handling everything right so your engineering team will have a good understanding of system but not everybody the evaluation combines all of them engineering operations and security team all of them needs to think like an attacker and evaluate the entry point pot potential entry point of an attacker trace those paths and probably mitigate them this ensures that all the team in, are on the same path and the team has a fair idea of what's going on in the threats and, and the possible mitigation 
So if you are not using threat modeling, I would strongly, I would urge you to do this as at least helps you understand the security requirements for your team. If you are convinced and interested to learn more about threat modeling uh, for IoT system, I, I, would, I would recommend a talk from Dan Cornell from OWASP AppSec Europe 2018. This talk, this entire talk is about threat modeling for IoT device. And I think it's a must watch for you if you want to implement in your, uh, in your ecosystem. And also sometimes, and also sometimes SAST can help you identify the security vulnerabilities within the device. And yes, I'm not paid for it, but yes, we have been using check marks for SAST and, and this works really well. So, uh, so I think the countermeasures on the application layer, uh, I think uh, we, we are in sort of time. Let's, let's quickly wrap up this. Uh, so on the application layer, the obvious countermeasures are using the strict password policies, implementing the lockout mechanisms and, and use widely accepted algorithms rather than building your own, right? So, and on, 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 on the application layer vulnerabilities, keep an eye on the OWASP top end and have them on your priorities to be mitigated. And the vulnerabilities of, you know, the first on the list we had was the application layer, right? So this includes all the injection issues and authentication issues. To be honest, most of the, most, most of the injection issues could simply be solved by not trusting the user input. Most importantly, not allowing the unsanitized user input to, you know, operating system commands. This helps you prevent any sort of privileged command injection issues. Similarly, on the, the countermeasures for firmware are that, you know, always update the firmware over HTTPS in order to prevent the man the mail attacks and also implement the forced update mechanism with the entire rollback to prevent the critical vulnerabilities. Implement the firmware integrity in order to verify and check if the firmware has been actually modified by the vendor or not. The other common stuff include avoid hard coding any secret inside the firmware. Whatever component is it, one thing you always need to make assumption is that they'll be purchased, dissected and studied. One of the most common develop, uh, mistake that developer make is that they'll not be studied enough. So the attacker, the hackers will not be interested enough to uh, in the product to reverse engineer, right? So this is the assumption what makes developers, you know, stuff and hardcode certain credentials inside the firmware. So similarly, the countermeasures on uh, hardware and uh, your communications are pretty much given here. I think we're sort of on sort of time. Let's quickly wrap up this. Uh, so we we had one slide. I think you might be interested in this, uh, but I think we have discussed this as well. So let's quickly focus on the best practices for security, um, you know, for, for security. So, uh, so here in the best practices, uh, the, one of the one of the main thing that you could do is minimizing, you know, minimizing the exposure. So any one thing that you should always keep in mind is that the very moment when you increase the exposure, the very moment when you increase the exposure, remember that you have opened up the entire attack surface for people to at come and attack, right? So minimize the exposure. Uh, try not to use. Uh, try not to uh, send the devices with the uh, debug ports in the production. Try not to uh, you know unnecessarily open the ports and leave it off. Also for the open so for the operating system, stripe the operating system to the bare minimum. Uh, stripe the operating system as much as you can to the least that you can. Right. So this this enable this enables you to decrease down your attack surface and and the ways the attack the attackers could get into your IoT device. So. Um, and, and, and I think uh, that there are a lot of best practices. I think uh, embracing the zero trust policy is one of the very important that you could always do uh, to prevent any lateral entry in, inside the network, even if it gets hacked. Um, and, and, and managing a vulnerability disclosure, uh, disclosure program is also very important uh, in, in terms of best practices. Um, but I think because of time, uh, we'll have to skip this as well. There are, there are a lot of best practices and, and probably you can take a picture of this slide or uh, even I think I'll, I'll, I'll be uploading this slide in uh, the scale as well. Uh, you can you can uh, take a look at them and probably, you know, uh, implement in your um, and share this within the developers. Uh, I think we have come towards the last slide. There are a couple of good reads and good talks. I think you can find them on the Internet. Uh, that's pretty much for today. Um, I think I think you have launched uh, a lot. I think you have launched something new with this talk, and I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, that's all, guys. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and uh, I hope that you all stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much for attending.